Well, thanks everybody for coming out and st sticking around for the last talk of the day. And uh, this is my first ever talk at a conference, so this is really exciting. Um, and if I've learned anything about talks from other people, you always start off with a question. So my question is, who here is setting resource limits on their, uh, on their pods or containers? Okay, so quite a few people. Now who here is using load testing techniques to set those resource limits? Okay, not quite as many hands, but still a few people. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, well, today I want to convince you that, that using some of the load testing techniques to set those are a good idea. So uh, I'm an engineer at Buffer, and a lot of what I do is help transition from a monolithic application. Everything's written in PHP and uh, a few front-end frameworks, and we're working towards moving, moving towards Kubernetes. And we've had a fair amount of success with this. And at the moment, we've got about 75% of all of our production traffic served by Kubernetes. So I'm gonna jump into a case study. And we started off with a pre-existing endpoint in our monolith and one of our higher throughput endpoints. And this particular endpoint's responsibility is to serve the number of times a link has been shared within the Buffer app. And Buffer is a social media application, so knowing how many times somebody has uh, shared your blog is important information. And people actually uh, use this to put a button on their blog to know how many times people have shared it so you can gauge interest on something. So we eventually settled on a design using Node and DynamoDB. Um, it just happened to be the right performance and price range for what we were trying to accomplish. So we built the service, and then we started to, to, roll, to roll it out to Kubernetes. And we had about four replicas to start off with. And we manually verified that things were working with curl. So we shifted about 1% of our, our traffic over to this service. And things were looking great. Um, we had monitoring hooked up with Datadog, and you, you could barely notice that there was any load running on each of the containers. Same story at 10%. Then we scaled things up to 50% of all of our traffic. And this is where things started to get a little hairy. So the first thing we did was scaled up our replicas up uh, five times. To, so we had 20 pods running. And this helped, but we still got that OOM killed error that, that, that's very dreadful. So we shifted back our traffic onto our monolith and started to investigate what was actually going on there. So what had happened is I had copied and pasted a deployment file from another service. And this particular service was a, a node service that didn't have as much traffic. And, and we were still pretty new to this at the time. Um, and, this, and this deployment file contained some resource limits. So uh, when, when we were doing the uh, kubectl describe, the, the pods were reporting OOM killed. So let's talk a little bit about what resource limits actually are. Uh, there's something that can be set on both CPU and memory. And when they're not set, these things can, they can run unbounded and they can actually take up all the resources on the node that they're on. And when the limits are exceeded, Kubernetes is gonna go through and it's gonna, it's gonna kill those pods. So how do we go about actually setting these things? So it's, it's helpful to discuss what op optimal limits actually look like. This means that pods have enough resources to complete whatever task they're given, whether that's HTTP, maybe it's a worker um, doing work on a queue, and also each of the nodes can run the maximum number of pods, so there's no waste. So it's helpful to talk about ways that things can go wrong and also things can go right when you're uh, allocating resources. So the first one is under allocation. This one's really obvious. This is what happened to us. We didn't have enough resources allocated. And what Kubernetes is gonna do is recognize that one of your limits has been cro uh, crossed and it's going to kill, it's gonna kill the container. The other one is over allocation. This is where you've given your, your pod or your container enough uh, resources that uh, it's never actually going to be able to use those for the load that, that you're trying to service. 
And this is a tricky problem to detect because things, things can work for a while. And you, you can be in this place where you're running, uh, you, you're, you're handling all of your load and, and things look great. But it becomes a problem when you start to scale up your replicas. Let's say that you've got one container that um, is wasting five uh, megabytes of memory. You scale that up to 100, you're wasting, you're wasting 500 and so on and so forth as you scale up. So this, here's a little picture that, that illustrates this. Um, if I give one workload half the resources on a node, that means I can only run two of, of the replicas on a node. Now if I give it the appropriate amount of resources, that's an extra container that it can be running. And, and if you take away anything from this talk, I think this is the one thing, is if you set your container resource limits correctly, you're going to you're going to save money and you're going to be utilizing the resources that Kubernetes provides. So that's one extra pod in that example. So let's talk a little bit about how Kubernetes monitoring works under the hood. Uh, this graph, there's, there's a lot going on here, but I wanted to show this first because I think it's important. Uh, I think it shows that there's the centralized thing in the middle called Heapster that's orchestrating, or that's collecting information and also providing an API to other parts of the system. Um, so each node is effectively working through Heapster and the Kubernetes master is making that information available. Also Heapster pushes things off to a, a storage backend. That's pretty important too. So let's dig a little bit into the, the details here. So the, the first step is C advisor. And what that does is monitors all of the uh, containers on a given node. And it's going to be getting information about uh, network, CPU, file system, and s memory utilization. And then on top of that, the kubelet's going to be getting information from Z C Advisor. And it's going to use the information from C Advisor to make decisions on whether things should, should be killed and also use it for some monitoring. And then on top of that, there's Heapster which essentially aggregates all of the information from all the kubelets on all the nodes and makes that information available um, and it pushes it off to a storage backend. That could be InfluxDB with Grafana. It could also be uh, Google Cloud Monitoring is another one and there's a bunch of third party backends that you could also use. So how do we go about setting limits? The, the, the goal is really just to understand what one pod can handle here. And you start with a really conservative set of limits. So you start really low. And you change one thing at a time, and you observe the changes. Um, you try to be scientific about it, because if you change too many things, uh, it's, it's kind of hard to understand what actually happened when you change something. So there's a couple of testing strategies that I'm going to employ to actually set the limits. And the first one is a ramp up test. And what we're going to do is start with uh, one client and then we're going to scale up the clients until and, and just watch what happens to the response times um, for the for this particular test and the idea is that you you eventually want to find a breaking point you're, you're looking for major changes maybe you cross a threshold and then all of a sudden you're getting a bunch of 500s after that um, we're essentially going to take the this slice the the tallest slice where we're right before we broke. And then we're going to operate just under the breaking point for an extended period of time. And what we're going to look for here is, um, is major changes in response times. Maybe you get some variance. Uh, but what you want to see here is pretty consistent load, pretty consistent response times. And this is also where you make fine-tuned adjustments as well. So I'm going to do a demo. Um, I'm going to set limits for an etcd uh, pod. I'm going to take this off. All right. It's like it's flickering. Is that visible? <laughs> um, I'm going to increase the font size here. So. Um, I'm watching the pods, and I've got one Nginx container running right now, and 
if you remember before, I said I was going to be setting things for um, etcd. The reason why I have to do this, and I'm just going to show, oh, yes. Hopefully it works. <laughs> Maybe there's too many cables. <laughs> Yep. That's fine. This one. That looks better. I have to readjust all of the settings. It's okay. What? Oh. <laughs> I didn't do it. Part two. Okay. 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 It really okay. Let's see if I can. I'll make this one smaller. This is tricky. I don't even know what all my screens are. Uh. All right. Okay. Uh, does this really matter that much? It's like right on the edge. All right, well, we're gonna roll with this. Okay. <laughs> All right. So I've got an Nginx server and that's expose, or that's proxying requests out to etcd. And I'm also exposing a loader IO token. I'm basically using, I'm using loader IO to run these load tests. And I need to expose a token to give them permission to, to, run, uh, to run load tests. Um, so that's, that's why this looks like. I thought it was important to call that out because it would look a little funky. Um, so I'm going to create a deployment. <laughs> 
And while that's creating, I'm going to take a look at what the deployment file actually looks like. Uh, it's pretty, pretty low resources, um, using 50M, which is a roughly 1 20th of a core and 4 megabytes. <laughs> and it looks like the container came up. So um, I'm going to uh, exec into it. So I can grab a shell. And I'm just going to show you that um, that there's 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 a there's some data in the etcd um, service. Don't worry, this is expected. Uh, the, the the resources are so constrained here that I can't even run a command. So it's a pretty good idea that I should probably. Uh, I should probably give this thing more room to breathe here. So I'm going to edit the deployment and give it a little bit more resources. And I'm going to increase the memory uh, to, to 50. We're going to watch that container restart. And if you remember before, uh, I was talking about the monitoring. Uh, I'm actually going to tap directly into the uh, C advisor. And I'm going to use that to get the resource limits. And that container came up. So um, here's C advisor here. It's a little clunky to get to it, but um, once I'm there, you can see that I've got my resource limits are showing up here. Um, the increased memory shows me CPU, and in this case, I've only got one core, so uh, the total usage and usage per, per core are going to look the same. And then we've also got um, some, some memory to look at. And that 50 that I set to, I, I, I have a lot more room to breathe now. If I would have looked before, this would have been about 100%. Um, so things are looking good. I'm going to start so the, I'm going to start running that ramp up test now. So um, here's a previous test. We're going to go from uh, 0 to about 250. So you'll see that the CPU um, utilization is starting to creep up here a little bit. And the data is not exactly real time, but it's about as close as, as you can get. As you can see here, memory jumped up a little bit, but um, not quite as much as the CPU. I'm still waiting for another update here. So uh, 0, 0, 005, um, just from doing this before, this is. Uh, this is the bottleneck here. This is, it's, it's hit its resource limit. Um, so what I want to do here now, since I can see that this is the bottleneck, it's kind of flatlined once it reached that point. Um, that's what I know I need to increase now. So if I take a look here um, at about 30 seconds um, and let's see, well, at, at, at the halfway point, I'm, I'm at, around 450 to 500 milliseconds for response time. So if this was, in fact, the bottleneck, I would expect that number to go down. So I'm going to edit the deployment again. And I'm going to increase this thing to uh, 500M for the CPU. And unfortunately, this isn't going to come up. I kind of wanted to show this because uh, this is something that can happen when you're setting resource limits. Um, if I do a describe on that pod, I'm going to see that it, it failed, uh, failed to get scheduling because it didn't have enough resources to, for, for the CPU. And, um, this particular cluster is really, really small, so it's kind of expected to do that. 
Um, so I'm going to set that to something a little bit more reasonable. I'm going to rerun that test, and what I'm expecting now is to see better results. At, at something better than about 500 milliseconds at 30 seconds would, or 500 milliseconds response time at halfway point through the test. Oh, I need to go grab. So unfortunately, see advisor change, or the ID of, of things change when the pod goes down, so I have to go grab it again. I did. Yeah, you wouldn't want to do this in production. <laughs> so we're at about the halfway point, and we can already see um, we're at around 133 milliseconds. So it, at the moment, that is in fact our bottleneck. And I don't have any more resources on this machine to give it. So that this is effectively the most I can do with this setup. Um, you can also see here that we've, we've hit our resource limit, um, 0 0.15. So at this point, um, I can take a look at uh, loader IO is pretty nice because it can show you uh, what, what request per second you were actually doing. And it looks like we're doing something where, somewhere between 800 and 900 requests per second. Um, so the next test, that duration test, I would actually probably want to run with something like uh, 800. So I've, I've got another test prepared. Um, it's going to do 800 clients over one minute. And if you were doing this uh, in production, you probably want to do this as long as you can. Um, something more than 10 minutes, maybe an hour, uh, depending on what you have bandwidth for. So I'm going to go ahead and kick that test off. And really what you want to see here is once things kind of level out, your, uh, your response times should should remain. Um, do I have the other test running? No. Your response time should remain relatively fat, uh, flat, and this graph is looking kind of interesting. Um, usually, it sticks around uh, 100 milliseconds. Uh, would probably want to dig into to what happened there and why uh, why that why that increased for a certain period of time, but. Um, could also be that somebody here is running load tests on this. <laughs> so, all right. So when you're going through this process, uh, it's really important to keep a fail log. And what, what you want to see, or what, what you want to write down or think, uh, the way that things failed, things are going to break when you do this, it, especially when you get to the point where you're crossing the threshold of, of the particular pod. And some of the stuff that we've seen, uh, memory slowly increasing, uh, what we saw there was the CPU is pegged at, at the resource limit. Um, we've also seen 500s high response times. Uh, a little more interesting is when you see large variance in response times. Um, we had a, a cron job that was running uh, that, that was causing one of these. It was pretty interesting that, to catch that. Um, and also, dropped request is another common one. So when we were going through this process with the link service, um, really what we, when, what we were trying to accomplish here was we, we needed to understand how things break. And for us, it, it, things don't feel production ready until you go through a process like this, because you don't really understand what's going to happen when you're pushing things towards the edge. And um, really, it's about increasing predictability. And this is important, because when, when things are predictable, you can understand how to scale this up. Uh, you have sort of a unit of scaling 
And though it's not exactly linear, it's also important to do this with, um, with more pods to, to get closer to the load that you want to match. But really, it's just about predictability. So just looking forward with Kubernetes, uh, there's so many great tools for ops and things that are done on the cluster-wide level. But um, I think developers really want to be able to dig into one thing sometimes and get, get their hands dirty and to do some debugging. And there's some tooling that could exist that just doesn't yet. And um, I think it's just kind of the natural prog progression of Kubernetes. Um, some of the talks earlier today have reflected this too. Um, to, or developers, developers want to be using Kubernetes too. Uh, so I just want to say thanks everybody and open it up for questions. <laughs>
might need uh, GPUs on it. Or maybe uh, you need instances with lots of memory because you're, you're running Redis on, the, on them or something like that. Uh, for us, uh, more compute tends to be better. Uh, I mean, we, we use the compute instances, but I, I can't remember exactly which one. Like X uh, large or something? I don't know. I, I don't normally, I'm more on, I'm more on the, the application side of things. Yes? You said you like noisy neighbors, but what if they are suddenly, suddenly quiet? Uh, <laughs> the test is unpredictable, you know? Yeah. The, the question actually is, uh, do you have uh, resource limits on all your nodes that are in production? Uh, so the question is, do we have resource limits on all of our pods? The answer is yes, we do. Yeah. Yep. What's that? Do you use limit range? We do not. The, the question was, do we use limit range? And we don't. I'm, I'm going to look into it. <laughs> Any other questions? Anyways, thanks everybody, and uh... <laughs>